it's okay. Uh, yeah, so we're going to go through phase planes again today. We a lot of the stuff is is a, is a bit repetitive from what I said yesterday, but like I want to make sure that it's that it's fully ingrained. Um, so apologies for some of the repetition, but hopefully hearing it again will help like um, help you to understand exactly what's going on when we're doing this. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a bit more about null clines and and interpretation of null clines, and uh, in particular links with ideas level curves and isoclines. Who's heard of level curves before? Or isoclines? No, okay. Um, okay, so yesterday we, we drew some phase planes. Um, has anyone attempted any of the other phase planes? So there was, if you recall the, the resource competition model, we drew one phase plane for one particular combination of our interspecific competition coefficients A and B, um, but there are, um, there were four possibilities for I and B values, right? So that means that we've got four possible orientations for our null clients and hence our phase planes. Okay. So did anyone have a go at sketching any of the others? Yeah. Okay. And did they look kind of reasonable or did it, did it make sense? Yeah. So like, yeah, when you sketch your, those phase planes, if you haven't already had a go at them, remember the table that we had yesterday, listing what was a saddle and a stable node and all of those. Go back and refer to that table and make sure your phase planes make sense, okay? I'd say that as a general point across all, pretty much all of the stuff that we do. If you have, um, and a common mistake that students make is that they'll say, you know, a question might ask, do some algebraic analysis and find the stability algebraically. Now sketch a phase plane. And over here, they show the, say, an equilibrium as a stable node. And over here, they've got it as an unstable spiral, right? The two things should always match up. So make sure if you have the ability to check these things, go back and check them. Likewise, with things like, you know, if you find equilibria, by death, you know, you go through and you do your algebraic de derivation to find an equilibrium. By definition, if you substitute that back into your original equations, those equations, if they're ODEs, they should be equal to zero, right? So it is, if you've got a little bit of time, it's always handy to just go back and check to make sure that the thing that you've derived makes sense from the original um, starting point, okay? So those are just a couple of tips to, to uh, make sure that they're kind of sense checks, right? To, to make sure that what you're, what you're producing actually um, matches what it, should, what it should be, okay? So we're gonna do a bit more sketching and phase planes today and thinking about what they actually mean. Um, so if you recall, to sketch a phase plane, suppose we've got two equations, dx dt is some function f of xy, and dy dt is some other function g of xy, and these x's and y's could represent anything. Most of the time we're talking about population sizes or densities, okay? So population density of species one and species two. And then to sketch a phase plane, we need to think about our null planes. Uh, our null planes, the species X are going to be all solutions to dx dt is equal to zero. And for y, dy dt is equal to zero. Now these could be straight lines. They could be curves. It could be anything, okay? So often in a lot of our examples, they end up being straight lines because some of the examples we do are simpler, but there's nothing to stop this being a quadratic. Okay, or, or anything. Okay, so we, we have some lines now, and these null clines just tell us as you move along that null cline, there is no change in that particular species density, okay? So we then have our equilibria, and they're gonna be all points that satisfy dx dt is equal to what dy dt, which is equal to zero, okay? So in other words, these are the intersections of our null clines, but they have to be intersections of null clines for each species. So you might have intersections between, say you've got two null clines for species X. If those two null clines for species X intersect, that doesn't imply that there is a, an equilibrium there. You need to have an intersection between one for X and one for Y. And then lastly, we need the direction field. I'll represent this here as a vector. If you were to plot this, numerically, and there's actually some Jupyter code that's uh, referred to in the self-study problem here. Typically that will show both the direction and the magnitude of the direction field at a particular point. 
But when we're sketching these things, we don't really care about the magnitude, we just care about the direction. So if we care about the sign of dx dt and the sign of dy dt. We don't really care about how big that is. Okay, that's because we're usually using these phase planes to to qualitatively understand what's going on. So in other words, we want to understand the the directions, which is a qualitative thing, whereas the the magnitude is something that's quantitative. So maybe the magnitude tells you how quickly you're moving in a particular direction, but your uh, qualitative um, direction is in which way you're going, okay? So those are three things we need. And typically we focus on finding the direction field on our null climbs, because by definition on a null climb, only one species at most can be changing, okay? So if the X dt is equal to zero, then species X is not changing its density. If that's along the horizontal axis, then that means that any point along that null climb our direction field has to be crossing it vertically. So we must be either going up or going down. We can find our direction field at any point in the plane, but that would end up being a vector like this, where there's some X component and some Y component. It's much easier to just focus on the null climbs where you only have to think whether you're going up or down or left or right, depending on whether it's an X or a Y null climb, okay? So we do that and we can also use the continuity of these functions to deduce the, the directions anywhere else in the phase plane because of that. Okay, so what are these null climbs? Well, I mentioned at the start this idea of level curves or isoclines. This is a more general phenomenon, and it might help to think about some, some real-world examples of isoclines or level curves, okay? So a level curve of a function, so we've got some function f of x, y. Ignore the fact that we're using differential equations um, at the moment. So just some function f of x, y, f of x, y, if we plot you know, in a surface, so we have x and y, and if we set z is equal to f of x, y, then when we plot f of x, y, it's going to be some, I'm terrible at drawing in 3D, which we'll see now. We have some surface, okay? So if our x and y coordinates are just you know, positions on this table, and we have a function f of x, y, if we plot z, the height above the table is equal to that function f of x, y at any coordinate on that table, that gives me some surface, okay? And that the height of that surface corresponds to um, that function value at that given coordinate of x and y, okay? So we've got some surface that we're plotting. This is my z is equal to f of x, y. And then a level curve is basically saying, okay, suppose I care about 10 centimeters above this uh, table. I'm now going to take a slice through that surface. So that surface, imagine it's just say like a, um, a bowl or something like that. I'm going to take a slice through at whatever height, 10 centimeters. And then when I've taken that slice through, that will give me some curve that might be joined up. It might just be a straight line. It could be a curve of, that's unjoined up. Okay. If I just think about that curve now, that's saying everything that is, say, 10 centimeters above this table is along that curve. And that's a level curve. So that level curve is basically saying, when do we have our function equal to some constant? I'll skip ahead for a moment here, just because it's easier maybe to think about this. This is a map of Burnaby Mountain. Uh, uh, so we're somewhere over here right now in the AQ. All of these, if you look at any sort of topological map like this, these lines that are going around, they tell you what? Anyone? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So there's the particular height, it's a contour, right? So it's saying, okay, what is the particular height above sea level? If you walk along, if you are able to walk along that path, you wouldn't be changing your height at all, right? So that is a level curve. It's just a level curve on a topographical topographical map. So if you think, if it helps to think about these ideas of level curves in terms of height above sea level on a mountain, contours on a map, that's a good way to think about it. If we then think about isoclines, isoclines are very related to this. So they're essentially saying they are um, level curves for our functions we have, say, our dx dt is equal to f of x y. 
and they're just equal to some constant c. Okay, so just like our level curves, but now we've added the fact that this is a rate of change. So now we're saying along any of those curves, our rate of change is equal to this constant. And this constant could be, say, if I draw a sketch here, suppose this is a level curve, f of x, y was equal to one. Okay, so the rate of change anywhere along that curve is equal to one. I joined it closed here, but it doesn't have to be closed, it could be open. Would there also be one for dy dt? Exactly, yes. So yeah, there would be there would be one for dy dt as well. If I just like on my contour map, I can draw different values of c. So this is f of xy is equal to zero. And then suppose we've got another one inside. It looks something like this, f of xy is equal to minus one. Just picking particular values here, because they could be any values. So all of these, they're all isoclines. Another context you might see this is if you look at a weather map and you see, look at the pressure, you'll see isobars, okay? So they're, they're saying the, the iso means same, essentially, right? So you have the same pressure, isobars. Isoclines are basically saying the same rate of change along these lines, okay? The key one is then this red one, where the rate of change is zero, and this has a special name, this is our null cline. Okay. So think about null clines as being like contours on a map. And along those, your height is equal to zero. Okay. Does that all make sense about null clines? Yeah. Cool. So now let's think about direction fields, a little bit more about this. So direction fields, like I said, they're telling us the, the direction of change at a particular point in the phase plane. And if you if you plot these numerically, as you'll find from that code at the that's, uh, that's in a Jupyter notebook on Canvas, you'll see that the, the arrows showing the direction field at any point in this plane have both direction and magnitude because they're vector quantities. But we really only care about the direction when we're sketching these things. Okay. So because we're on, if we think about our null clines, the uh, if say we're on an alpine for species X, we can't have any change in the population size for species, species X, or dx dt is equal to zero. That means that we can only be moving in the direction of Y. So if that's vertical, our arrows have to be going up or down as we cross through that null plane. And our direction can only change from being say up to down as we pass through a null plane for species Y or vice versa. You can only transition from going left to right as you move through a null plane for species X. Okay, because by definition, on one side of that null plane, say dx dt is going to be positive. On the null plane, dx dt is going to be equal to zero. And on the other side, say dx dt is positive. So it'd be going from left to then up or down, but no left or right, and then to right in that sequence. Okay. So it's nice thinking about the direction field on the null climbs because we only have to think about movement going up or down or left and right and not thinking about it's going up and right or down and left and so on, okay? So what do these look like? Suppose we've got straight lines. Suppose y equals mx plus c is a null climb for species x. Then by definition, dx dt is equal to zero at every single point along that line. It's a level curve essentially. And so we care then about every point along that line. What is the direction for y? And we only care about the sign of dy dt. So we need to look at our dy dt. We have an equation for dx dt, and we have an equation for dy dt. By definition, on our null climb for x, dx dt must equal zero. We just then need to substitute this value of y. We have an equation for y. And this could be in terms of y's or it could be in terms of x's. It doesn't matter which we eliminate. This is also another point that people also ask about. We'll get the same answer. It will give us the same directions. We can either eliminate x or we can eliminate y. We substitute this into our equation for dy dt. And then we'll get an equation in terms of x's or y's or the parameters in our system. And that will tell us when it is positive or negative. And so when this is positive, dy dt is greater than zero, our direction field is going to point up along that null line. And when it is negative, then it's going to point down. Okay, so if our line y equals mx plus c looks something like this, we might have 
dy dt being positive. So it will have got arrows as you cross through that null prime point up. Or it might look something like this. But they all point out. And typically, but not always, typically there'll be conditions where, depending on the parameters of your system or the values of your um, state variables x and y, that uh, for some parts of your null line, the arrows point up and some parts they'll point down. And they would change as you pass through an equilibrium. Okay. So key thing is that your arrows will only change direction from up or down in this case as you pass through another null line. And that passing through that other null line would correspond with an equilibrium. So for example, if you have a picture that looks like, just erase this for now. Suppose you had an old line like this for one of your species and this for the other one. There is an equilibrium at their intersection. On the left-hand side, this arrow goes up. On the right-hand side, the arrow will go down. So I've passed through this red null line. And so the direction has changed from up to down. Likewise, I suppose here it was going right on the left-hand side. On the left, on the right-hand side, it must be changing direction. So all I've just said then applies exactly the same to um, null clients for the other species. So suppose we have y equals ax plus b is a null cline for species y. In this case, we either have to move right when dx dt is positive or we move left when dx dt is negative. Does all of that make sense? Good. Like I said, I appreciate it's quite repetitive. I just want to make sure that this is clear. So as I just said, the sign of dx dt or dy dt only changes when we pass through a corresponding null line. Yes. So the path to change will be passed through an equilibrium point. Like it's forced to change, or can it all stay the same? Yes, there is there are uh there's a slight caveat to everything that I'm saying here in the sense that <clears throat> Your null cline, suppose your uh, dx dt is positive on the left hand side of your null cline and it's equal to zero here. We're assuming that it's changing sign. It is possible that it just touches zero and then it comes back and it is the same on both sides. However, whilst that's mathematically possible, because we're interested in mathematical biology, that essentially represents a knife edge scenario. So it's not very that's not a good biological model, essentially. So we never actually deal with those cases. So in all the cases that we look at, if you have an old time in it, it will change sign as you go through it. Very good question, yeah. Okay, so our, our sign of dx dt or dy dt only changes when passing through a null line. And so, sorry, that, that also corresponds to equilibrium, obviously, as well, right? Because it could, could just touch the equilibria and then change, but that would be a knife edge scenario. Um, okay, so we find, we can find the direction field for the entire phase plane just by looking at the direction field on two of our null clients. We don't have to, to find them on every single one of them. So let's just sketch a little example here. I'm not gonna write down the equations that correspond to this, but suppose I've got a, a phase plane that looks like this, and I'm gonna draw on some null clients. So I'm going to assume that I have a null cline here when x is equal to zero and here when y is equal to zero. I'll label this in a second. Suppose I've got another one that looks like this and another one that looks like this. And always make sure you label these in green. I'm going to say dx dt is equal to zero and in red dy dt is equal to zero. You don't have to do these in different colors. You could, uh, for example, uh, dash one of them. I usually do them in different colors if I can, just because it makes it a bit easier. And I have equilibria whenever a green line intersects a red line. And suppose I've found the direction field on the axes. Okay, these are two null lines in this case. And suppose, for example, my arrows point like this on the y-axis and on the x-axis, they point like this. Oh, 
want this one this way. Okay. So that's the, you know, I've done a little bit of algebra. I found these ones. It's usually easiest to find the ones on the axes if they exist, because one, by definition, one of them is going to be equal to zero. It's a little bit more complicated if we're on a non-zero, um, not quite. These won't always exist, but in many cases they will, because it means by definition that one of the species is extinct. Okay. So typically you would not be getting change in that species. We can't say for every circumstance that it will exist, and it depends exactly on the context. For example, you could have migration that's flowing in, and therefore it isn't equal to zero. But in this context, we are assuming there are some null clines on the axes. Okay, so I found these directions. Note I change direction as I pass through the null cline, uh, through the this green null cline here, which corresponds to an equilibrium, and the same up here. When I pass through the red null cline, I change direction. So now I want to know, okay, suppose I'm somewhere in this yellow segment here. What's my direction going to be? Well, I don't have to find the direction everywhere in the plane. I can just work it out by the continuity of these systems. Suppose if I zoom in even more, I jump a tiny little bit off this axis here. So rather than x being equal to zero, I've got x being equal to a very, very small number. I haven't passed through an old climb, so my arrow must still be pointing up. Okay, I must still, I can't be going down because this arrow is going up and I've moved a tiny bit away from it and these things are continuous. So this has to be pointing up. I've not passed through an old climb. The same applies down here. If I move a tiny bit off this axis here, I have to still be moving to the right. I can't suddenly be moving left because this is continuous. So that means that everywhere in this yellow highlighted region, I have to be moving up and to the right. Okay, so I could draw a net arrow if I like here. So all of my arrows will be moving, they'll have some up component and some right component. Okay, they're all moving up and to the right. I don't know the magnitude of those, but I know qualitatively what's happening. Okay, so now let's think about what happens in this next region up here. I can think about what happens as I cross this null plane, or I can just think about again what happens if I move a tiny bit off this axis here. So above this equilibrium, I move a tiny bit off there. Same logic applies that my arrow is going down, therefore I must be going down in this region. What else do I know? Well, this red null cline that's diagonal corresponds to dy dt to zero. And that makes sense, right? I'm moving up below it. I'm moving down above it. So that means that there must be no, left, no up or down movement on this red null cline, okay? Moving up when I'm below it, down when I'm above it. So that means all along this red null cline, I can only be moving left or right. And am I moving left or right? Well, let's think about this same argument at the bottom. If I start close to this null cline here, if I move a little bit up, I'm still moving to the right. If I move a little bit up, I'm still moving to the right, and so on and so on and so on, because it's continuous. I've not crossed a null cline. So when I get up to this null cline here, am I moving left or right? I have to be moving right still. Now, I could have worked this out algebraically, but I can deduce it just from these directions here. Okay, so in this region at the top left, I'm moving down and left. So my net movement is always somewhere in this direction. Down and right. Down and right, thank you, sorry. Make sure you know your left from right. Always a good plan. Okay, let's think about this region here on the top right. So. In this region here, if I keep applying the same logic, I'm moving down, always moving down as I go a little bit this way, a little bit this way, a little bit this way. All of these arrows, they have to be pointing down, right? So in this yellow region on the left, the top left, I'm always moving down, not moving up at all. The green null clines correspond to when dx dt is equal to zero. In other words, I can't be moving left or right at all as I cross this green line. I'm moving down to the right here. I'm only moving down here. 
That means on this side, as I cross dx dt is equal to zero, I have to be moving down and to the left. Okay. So this arrow here points down. Just make sure that's clear. In this region here, we had dx dt was positive because we're moving to the right. On this null line, by definition, dx dt is zero. On this side, dx dt must be negative, so we're moving to the left. We haven't changed the sign of our y at all because we've not crossed a red line. So in both of these regions, we're moving down. And then finally, this last region down here, apply the same logic before. We can actually sketch these other ones on now straight away if we really want to, because we know, in fact, I'll do this a slightly different way. We know as we pass through an equilibrium, the direction of our arrows must change. Okay, so over here, I'm moving left. If I follow all the way down that red null line, I pass through an equilibrium, so I must be moving left. Here. Sorry, I'm moving right here. Now I'm moving. And note that this corresponds to this arrow down here. I could have gone the other way around, and I would have got the same answer. And if I think about moving down this green null line, over here, I'm moving down. As I pass through the equilibrium on the other side, I must be moving up. Again, this arrow here corresponds to this arrow here. So in this bottom right region, we're moving left and up. So we have some net movement that looks like this. We can now then think about picking any point in this space, say here, this orange dot, I, mo I know that I'm moving down and to the right. So maybe I go in like this. Maybe I end up crossing this null cline here. Note that when I cross any of these null clines, I have to be crossing in the same direction as these arrows. Okay. Now, the common mistake that people do is they'll say, draw something like this. But that trajectory up there is not moving down, it has to be moving in the same direction. So maybe I move in something like this. Okay, so it's telling me that this is most likely to be stable. We can't necessarily tell whether it's a stable node or a stable spiral because we don't know anything about the magnitude of these directions. So we'd have to do a little bit of algebraic analysis to work that out, but it tells us something about how this looks stable because everything's kind of being pulled in. Okay, that's just an, a made up example. I want to go through a worked example now. So when we talked about species interactions, we talked about things like uh, uh, antagonistic interactions. So co things like competition, uh, we talked about mutualism um, and exploitation. Those are the main things that we're gonna be focusing on. There's one of the others was immensalism. And this is when one species experiences a negative interaction and the other exper experiences no uh, benefits or costs of being interacting with that species, okay? So an example of this might be a uh, spiteful killing. So one species may kill the uh, offspring of another species or may just you know, kill those species whenever it comes into contact with them, but it doesn't feed on them. It doesn't benefit from it. It just kills them out of spite. Okay, so here we've got a couple of non-dimensionalized equations. So we've got species one, it has some logistic growth that's been normalized. And then there's a negative term here, this is saying that species Y is killing species X at some rate A. And dy dt just has logistic growth in it. It doesn't actually have any, um, no effects of X on its growth at all. So that's why you have this zero here. Okay, so this is an example of something called immensalism. Okay, so let's sketch a phase plane for this system. And in fact, let's have, let's have a vote. How many of us are there? Four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to split it evenly, I know. Uh, who wants to work through this themselves as a, as a problem? Hands up. Who would prefer me to work through this as a problem? Okay, there seems to be more people. Okay, so I'll work through this as a problem. Um, have a go at, if you haven't already, applying these ideas to the um, to either ones from the problem sheet, uh, problem sheet three. Uh, or in the practice midterm, or the other examples of phase planes of the resource competition model that I left um, in the last lecture, okay? So have a go at practicing it in your own time. 
but I will work through this one with you guys. Okay, so the first thing I want to find is my null kinds. So dx dt is equal to zero. When does that occur? Well, let's load my equations back up here. I need to have x times by one minus x minus axy being equal to zero. So in other words, either x must equal zero or one minus x minus ay is equal to zero. And I'm going to write this in terms of y. So I have y is equal to one minus x over a. So these are my two null lines for x. They're both straight lines. Now I'll do exactly the same for y. When is dy dt is equal to zero? Well, let's just go back up to the equation here. We need this y times by one minus y equals zero. Can anyone tell me the null lines for y? Yeah. So y must equal zero or y must equal one. So I have four null points here. They're all straight lines. This is a straight vertical line. These are both straight horizontal lines. And this is a straight line with negative slope. At this point, it might be worth thinking about one of the intercepts. So if we think about, um, if we think of that, this is a, as a function. So y is equal to, uh, let's write this as, sorry, let's write this as y as a function of x is equal to one minus x over a, just to make sure this is clear. y of zero, so what's the intercept with the vertical axis? When x is equal to zero, this is equal to one over a. And when is the right-hand side equal to zero? That occurs when x is equal to one. So I know my intercepts for this straight line. I know it has a negative gradient, so there's a negative sign in front of the x. This bit in purple is not necessary to write down, but it might help you if you're not clear about where your sketch, uh, how to, to sketch the lines, okay? So the next thing we want to find our direction field. And I could find the direction field on all four of these null lines, or I could just find them on one of the green ones and one of the red ones and deduce the rest like I did a few moments ago. Is that a okay. question? No, was that a question? So here, yeah, so Sorry, good idea. Uh, after y, y of zero is followed by eight, then how would you... Oh, these are, sorry, these are separate things. I'm just working out the, let me label this more clearly. So if I want to find the um, y-intercept, that's this bit. And then here, this bit is the x-intercept. So where am I crossing the horizontal and vertical axis? Okay. So like I said, I could find the direction field on all of these null lines, perfectly legitimate thing to do, or I could just pick one of the ones for X and one of the ones for Y and work them out from that and then deduce the rest. So I'm going to pick X is zero and Y is zero as the two null lines because that'll make things a little bit easier. So I think about, okay, I'm stood somewhere on this null line when X is equal to zero, so species X, with none of them around. By definition, dx dt is equal to what? Zero, yeah. What do I need to look at to find the direction? Yeah, and what do I care about dy dt? Um, x equals zero. Yeah, so what do, so I need to substitute oh, x is equal to zero into dy dt, and then what, what am I trying to find out for dy dt? The sign of it, yeah. So dx dt is equal to zero by definition on this null line, and dy dt, there isn't actually an x in here at all. If you recall, it was just y times by one minus y. I'll just go back up here to remind you guys. There isn't an X in here, so it doesn't matter. You're still technically substituting it in. It's just, it doesn't appear there, okay? So we're only caring about, because we're talking about species, uh, population densities for these species, we only care about non-negative values. 
Okay, so there are negative values that would change the sign of this. We only care about non-negative values. So when is this positive? So when is this greater than zero? Yep. Wait, why is between zero? Yep, so if y is between zero and one, this is gonna be positive. And what, do, what direction will that correspond to? Up. up, yeah. So between when y is between zero and one, we move up. And when is this negative? When y is greater than one. Yeah. So when y is greater than one, this is negative. And what does that what direction does that correspond to? Yeah, great. Okay, so we've worked out those directions. Now we're going to look at the other null line when y is equal to zero. By definition, dy dt must equal zero because it's a null line for y. And what? Well, we need to look at the sine of dx dt. So dx dt, what was that? With x times by one minus x minus axy. Y is equal to zero, so we substitute the Y is equal to zero into here. So that's just going to equal zero. So dx dt is then x times by one minus x. This is quite nice because it's matching what we had above. If x is between zero and one, this is positive. And if x is greater than one, it's negative. What does positive correspond to, left or right? Right, okay. So when x is between zero and one, on this null line, we have to be moving right. When x is greater than one, we have to be moving left. If we had decided to work out the direction field on these null points here, Maybe I'll leave that as an exercise to make sure that you, you understand the process of substituting these things and it should match what comes up with the phase plane when we sketch it. So have a go at, at substituting these values in. So for example, on y is equal to one, we substitute that into our equation for the XTT and work out when is uh, that positive and negative. And you'll have something in terms of A's there. And likewise on this one, have a go at substituting this into our equation for dy dt and finding out when that is positive or negative. I would also say when you do that, try eliminating y. You could also try eliminating x. There is no x in there, right? So if you try and substitute in there, it will give you something strange. But in general, it doesn't matter which way you do it around. If you eliminate x or you eliminate y, you would get an equation, say that was in terms of x or y's here. Um, it wouldn't apply for this particular model, but as a, as a more general thing, if you did it, say, for the resource competition model, you could eliminate your uh, species one or species two variable, and it will give you slightly different conditions, but when it comes to sketching them, it will give you the same result, okay? So it doesn't matter which way around you do it. Okay, let's have a go at sketching the phase plane. So at this point, we haven't actually talked about when, like when we have equilibria, we've not actually found the equilibria for this model, but if you had, then you would find there would be a condition for your non-trivial equilibrium to exist, okay? And that's because we have, let's draw on the null lines that don't depend on variables, first of all, maybe that's the easiest thing to do. So I'm gonna draw on these first three null lines. It's so got X and Y, we have a null line species X, the green one. Let's just go back up here when X is equal to zero. So that's this line here. And then we had one when Y is equal to zero. And when Y was equal to one. Okay, so we have, let's just make sure we label these. The red lines are when dy dt is equal to zero, and the green lines dx dt is equal to zero. Now I have one more null point to sketch. 
and that was this one over here. Y is equal to one minus X over A. And I know that my intercept with the Y axis occurs at one over A. So by parameter A is gonna affect where the intercept is. This horizontal line here is, occurs when Y is equal to one. If A is, what am I doing? We're doing a green line, aren't I? If A is less than one, then one over A is going to be up here. So this will be a one over A up here. And if A is greater than one, my null line would look something like this. My one over A would be down here. Okay. So in this case, if A is greater than one, there's no intercept between this line and this line in the positive quadrant. Okay. They actually intercept somewhere over here when X is negative. But we can't have X being negative. So the value of A affects the position of this null coin and therefore affects how many intercepts we have. Therefore, how many equilibria we have. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a phase plane for A being less than one. That guarantees that there is an intercept between the diagonal line and the horizontal red line of Y is equal to one. And that means that there's an equilibrium here, one here, and one here. So here, so Y intercept is one over A, we have an intercept down here at one as well. Okay, now I need to draw on my directions. So let's think about on X is equal to zero. When Y is between zero and one, we move up. So when y is between zero and one, we move up. When y is greater than one, we move down. So as we pass through that equilibrium, we move down. And then for our line y is equal to zero, when x is between zero and one, we move right. Here we move right. When x is greater than one, we move left. I realize I've also missed off an equilibrium down here. Okay, so now we can deduce all the other directions, just like we did before. In this region, I'm bounded by arrows that move up and the right. So I must be moving up and to the right in this region. As I move into this region here, I must be moving down. I've passed through a null line dy dt is equal to zero. So that means I must be moving left or right. Because I was moving right at the bottom, I must be moving right here as well. If I now start moving in this direction here, the green line corresponds to dx dt being equal to zero. I can only therefore be moving up or down on this null line here. I'm moving down mm -hmm. in all of this region here, so I must be moving down still. So I'm now in this top right region. Just make sure that's clear. I'm in this region here now. It's, uh, sorry, these arrows here must be moving down to the right. In this region here, I was moving down from this green null line. I'm not crossing any more null lines in this region, so I still must be moving down. Now think about this red null line here. If I start on this, let's say some point here, I'm moving right, moving right, moving right. If I pass through an equilibrium, the direction of my arrow has to change. So here I must be moving left. That means in this region here, I must be moving down and to the left. And then finally, if I start somewhere on this green null line, I'm moving down, I pass through the equilibrium, I must now be moving up. That's one way of arguing it. I could have also argued that I have an arrow here moving up. So all the points within here must be moving up as well. 
this is a null sign for dx dt, so I must be moving up or down. I'm moving up here. I must be moving up. Yes. Is there anything special about the top where like you know, x equals zero intersects with x equals or y equals one? This one? Uh, no, nothing special about that at all. Um, it's not an equilibrium because we don't have an intersection between a green and red line. So yeah, a common mistake is that people would write would sketch this in here as an equilibrium as well because they see two knot lines inter intersecting. Especially, it might seem obvious now because I've drawn, drawn these in different colors. Often if people are doing it just in pencil, say, and they see an intersection between two lines, they sketch that in as an equilibrium. Okay, so that's why I use color here just to, to illustrate that it is different. Okay, so in this bottom right region, we're moving up and to the left. So now we can think about what happens if we say pick a starting point, it doesn't matter where I pick, just some value on a sketch of trajectory here. If I'm moving down and to the left in this region, perhaps I come in like this. If I start over on this side, I'm moving down to the left still, I'm moving down to the left. Now I'm going to cross this null climb going down. And in this region here, I'm now moving down and to the right. So perhaps I get pulled in like this. Alternatively, perhaps I would cross like this, down and to the right. Note that on this null line here, I can never actually cross from this region into this region. Because as soon as I hit this red line, I'm moving right. So I have to move right along there. Likewise, if I had started in this region, if I was moving down onto the left, suppose I was being pulled down very quickly, and we don't know the magnitude of these things, but I can't cross that null climb. I have to be pulled in in this region. Okay, so if you start above here, you stay above there. You can't get across that null climb, that red null climb. Likewise here, suppose we start in this region, moving up and to the right. I can't cross that red null climb here. I would move up and to the right. And then as soon as I cross into this region, I now move up and to the left. I'll get pulled in like this. So can anyone tell me what this, what this, how would we classify the stability of this equilibrium? Stable. Uh, uh, stable what? Let's do a process of elimination. Suppose my trajectories, I'm going to draw on this in brown here. Suppose my trajectory looked something like this. What would you say that was? Stable. Yeah, a stable spiral or a stable focus is what we call this in continuous time. So my trajectory is not doing that. Oh. So they're not spiraling around. So what's the other option? It's stable, right? Because all of my trajectories are being pulled in. Stable node, yeah? This is a stable node because all of my trajectories are being pulled in. It's stable. And it's a node because they're not spiraling in. Okay. If they were spiraling around, and those spirals, they have to be, you know, quite considerable spirals, not just sort of crossing one null climb. So here it crosses one null climb, but we're not looping round, round, and round. Okay. So this is a stable node. Yes. So in this example, you can use that as a stable node, but in that other example, you were saying that you still have to check a little bit out to make sure to check that there's a node as well? Exactly. Yeah. So you can usually tell whether something's stable or unstable, typically. But in this example here, for example, I know that I can't cross that red null climb going horizontally, right? So I can't spiral in. In the example previously, I could cross the null climb, and it depends on the relative magnitude. So Phase planes tell, can tell you a certain amount, but they can't always tell you like the distinction between a node and a spiral. In this particular case, we can because we know we can't cross that red null climb. Yeah. So when we're drawing a, uh, a phase plane on a miniature, yeah. Um, would you expect our diagram to have everything there? Like we're gonna pick points and show like trajectories. Typically, I would yeah, I would ask you to, to sketch a trajectory if it's possible to for it to be a stable node or a stable spiral. It's fine, whichever one you sort of draw on there. Like I wouldn't deduct marks. If it turned out to be a stable spiral, then you 
you know, you're, you're drawing kind of candidate trajectories, if you like. So if you had deduced earlier on that it was a stable node and you draw a spiral, then that would be incorrect because it would be inconsistent with the algebra that you've already shown. At this point, uh, you know, the one that I showed earlier up here, I could have drawn a candidate trajectory that maybe looks like this. We're going down and to the left and then up and then right. And I could have drawn something along those lines, right? And that would be still consistent with this diagram. If I had already shown that it was a stable node though, then that would be inconsistent, okay? Um, the main things, the trajectories are just kind of like illustrations to, to kind of show what you think happens. The main things are the, the null kinds and the direction field. And you know, if you can then pick a pick a point to illustrate it, then that's that's nice. Cherry on the on the cake, if you like. Okay, that's it for today. Um, like I said, there is, in fact, actually, what you could do is you could have a go at sketching the other phase plane if you want. So this was if a was less than one. Have a go at the one where a is greater than one. I'll, I'll post the solution um, in the field notes. And yeah, there is a Jupyter notebook that. Uh, allows you to sketch phase planes for the resource competition model, and you can vary the parameters A and B less than one or greater than one, and then hopefully that will again give you a bit of an idea of the orientation to those, and you can use that to check your answers. So have a go at sketching them first by hand, and then use the Jupyter notebook to check your answers are correct. Okay? I'll obviously, the, the notes uh, also include the correct answers as well, but it means that you can, you can do a bit of a check yourself. Okay?